ask you to settle. That's right. So uh, it's, uh, I've been given the, the privilege to uh, to introduce Grant, um, and I think sort of to, to the audience here, yeah, he hardly needs any introduction, but nevertheless. Um, so uh, a principal scientist with us, um, and he, he comes to us uh, from a background of uh, wildlife ecology, um, and before that, uh, genetics. And um, so sort of through through his time here, uh, just over over ten years, um, he's. Uh, Accomplished, accomplished a lot, and published very well, um, and has been has been recognised for a number of awards. Now, I mean, there's um, you know something that could be sort of said of, of many researchers at Erie um, that their sort of persona, um, or the public persona, is very sort of closely um, allied to their to their subject of study, and so um, aerobic rice and bass come to mind, as do uh, Nolly and Digna with heirloom rice. In all this case, blast Martin Gummett with the um, with the, the super bag, but uh, for Grant, um, it's, it's it's very clear where where his interests, his research interests lie, um, and that's in his association with rodents. Now you don't have to go back many decades in the in the rural areas before um, the rat man uh, was was the lowest uh, lowest profession. And uh, if you did particularly well um, as a rat catcher, as the rat man, uh, then you, uh, you stepped up and you became um, an itinerant grave digger. And then if you're fortunate to, to find a place in society, then you become uh, the village grave digger. But, um, you know, Grant has, has elevated the, uh, the role uh, to, to a very noble profession. And um, not only you know, has he encouraged many others uh, to following his footsteps, and, and I can see a number of, uh, of budding rat people in the audience, uh, both boys and girls, um, that uh, he's, he's, in, he's encouraged the, uh, the next generation of rat people. And I think what's so remarkable is that, is that he's done this at the, at the same time as, as he's guided and steered um, what was a fairly large ship, uh, the um, Irrigated Rice Research Consortium. Um, which ran across 10 countries, and uh, he, he, uh, he convened and coordinated that um, over, over 10 years. Um, and you know, and uh, at the point when the donor, donor interest was sort of signaling that, that, they, that, that um, they'd probably um, come to the end of their interest there, uh, he was able to, uh, to, uh, to encourage others, to convene, the, convene the scientists, um, and have sort of a redirection uh, of the work into uh, Project Cory Gap. And, um, and, that, and that led to a you know, signal from the donor that, uh, yes, indeed, this was a, this was a novel, novel topic and one would certainly sort of fit with their, their interests. And, and so it, it breathed new life into the work um, Iri's, Iri's work with, with national programs, which of course goes right to the very heart of what we need, and, and indeed we need much more of it. We almost can't get enough of it. Um, so I think the you know, the Cory Gap project is a is a good example, and that's what we're going to hear from today. Um, so with that, um, I'll give you a grant. Thank you. Thank you, David. I had purposely prepared to talk without mention of rats, but already is sort of it's because it's interesting that even though I was employed at Erie to manage a project, that Bob Ziegler always introduces me as the rat man, and I find that quite peculiar because I'm not employed at Erie specifically to work on rats. So today I want to take you on a journey and talk about Corrie Gap. And as David mentioned, it's a project that's funded by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SBC. And it's a project that's been going since 2013. And what I want to do today is give an overview of phase one of Corrigat. That I want to talk about some of the work that we're doing and give you a flavour of the multidisciplinary, and in some cases I would even say transdisciplinary, because we're bringing together people who do not usually work together, and some highlights of the exciting progress, and then a few slides at the end on where next.
So what is Cori Gap? Basically, it's a, we're looking at trying to do two major tasks. One is to reduce rice yield gaps, and this is in the lowland intensive system. It's the rice bowls of, of the countries we're working in. And we want to increase the environmental sustainability of rice production in these intensive systems. Now, it's a, we're very closely aligned with our partners in six countries. And as I mentioned, we're currently in phase one, and I'll come back to talk about where we are in relation to what happens beyond 2016. If you look at the, the vision of GRISP, and in the sort of prelude to this seminar, I did give the vision of Corrigap, and we see that there's a very strong alignment. We're looking at reducing poverty, which is the first part of the vision of GRISP. We're looking to improve health, reduce the environmental footprint. And I'll come back to that issue very briefly during my talk about what it means by that. The high quality research, which I should go about saying, and also, most importantly, the partnerships and the strong partnerships we have in the region. And the structure of, of Corrie Gap is that we have an advisory committee, and that advisory committee is drawn from the six countries that we're working in. And, for example, three of them are the, the, the DGs of the Rice Research Institutes, for example, in um, Sri Lanka, um, in Indonesia, um, and also in, in Thailand, or definitely in Thailand. With each country, we have a local champion. So, uh, Zua Zong in China, um, Nuning um, Subekti in Indonesia, Curtis Sina in Sri Lanka, Naomi Tway, who initially was working with Department of Agricultural Research, but now is a, is a postdoc with the project for the last 12 months in Myanmar, um, Lada Viryankura in Thailand, and Phan Van Nhu Zhu in, uh, in Vietnam. Now these people are really worth their waiting goal. When we're looking at trying to analyze whether the project is successful or not, often they say, oh, how strong are your partnerships? Well, if you've got someone who is really online and interested in what you're doing and has the buy-in, then they play just an essential role in what happens in country. And within these, each of these countries, we have, we have hubs. And this is shown in this, this graphic here. So in, in Indonesia, or in South Sumatra, and also in Yogyakarta, in Central Java. So we have two sites in Indonesia. In Sri Lanka, in Koyanochi, and in Naruya. And so this one here is actually part of their main rice belt. And this one here is an area where the Tamil unrest was over the last decade. So it's an area that was chosen to see how we had spillover into these areas. Then in, in Myanmar, initially, we were just linking with other projects that we're involved in, in the, in the Awadi Delta and also in Bago region. But now we have a new site just here in Napadan in, in Bago. In Thailand, the Central Plains of Thailand, the Konsawan. In Vietnam, it's the Mekong Delta, so Long An, Kentu, and Anjiang. And up here in China, it's just the one province. Guangdong province, but it has 110 million people. And there, although it's just, a, you know, this is actually one province, but there's four sites that we're working in Guangdong. We also aligned with other, other projects and other donors. This is where the Irrigated Rice Research Consortium um, as it provides an umbrella arrangement. And these look at co-investment and linkages. Um, and this is, at, for example, at national government level. And certainly people who have been involved, Erie scientists and Corrigap have been involved in lots of discussions recently in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Indonesia, where we're trying to see how we can leverage funds from those governments for research. In Myanmar, we have two projects there. One's just finished, but also we have a project funded by the Australian government um, and that um, has similar ap approaches in terms of the adaptive research. In Vietnam, we have a World Bank project which is beginning now, 
although we probably won't begin on the ground until February next year, called VNSAT. And we have a, a small project called Give to Asia that Bu Yung Hardy now coordinates, and that's focusing on capacity building. So these are all linked with what we're doing with Corrigat. And the one at the bottom is a very important one, and that's the Sustainable Rice Platform. That's the United Nations Environment Program. In fact, they're going to have an, on their, their annual meeting next week in, in Alabang. And what we're doing in the field provides the on-the-ground activities at the moment with the SRP. This presentation, I'm making, I'm going to give acknowledgements up front because a lot of the slides I'm presenting, you'll notice a number of them I have at the bottom, some acknowledgement as to who provided them. I haven't done it for all the slides, but most of them. But this is the team that's been involved with, with Corrigap. And we also have an impressive team of NRS staff, and as I mentioned, they're NARS partners, and I only mention on the covering slide in terms of the structure of Corrigap, who are the key partners, but we have a number of people in each country also involved in our work. And just recently, we've got Sudhir, Krishna, and Ando who will be involved for certain portions of their time in Corrigap. And I'd like to just highlight here how we do have a younger generation in terms of Alex, Peter, Nyomi, Krishna, and Ando who are currently postdocs here at Erie. And they provide a very important energy to the project of Corrigap. With Corrigap, we're making sure we're aligned with the national priorities, the national um, programs at the moment in relation to the lowland irrigated cropping system. Um, the other thing I should have mentioned in terms of our um, people involved, that we, we get feedback. Um, so we, we, we've had um, um, James Quilty, um, has been also given us some advice, and um, also we've had um, input from the, the rice breeding as well. So in Vietnam, they have um, a situation now where Mok Phai Nam Jian, which is a carryover, and one must do five reductions from our work in, um, in Vietnam with the IRRC. It's now seen as it's been adopted as a, a national program of best practice and so there's a, a presidential decree and that's important because it means that the extension agencies can put funding into those activities and that's now the basis of this new project funded by the World Bank, VNSAT. And farmers are forming cooperatives, they'll get support but they only get support if they can demonstrate that they are following best practice and the best practice is the one must do five reductions. In Indonesia, is a new initiative called GPPTT, um, and that's basically looking at acceleration of their current integrated crop management, ITM. In Thailand, it's aligned with National Cost Reduction Initiative. In China, um, they have a program there called Three Controls Technology, and it's now got alternate wetting and drying, drying linked to that. And we're looking at a, a strong focus in reducing fertilizer use and also reducing pesticide use. In Myanmar, we're assisting the development of best practices, and in Sri Lanka, they're one of the key interests there, they really sort of ticks the box when we start talking about environmentally sustainable rice production. So we're keeping um, a view on what is happening in each of these countries, and probably every second time I go in country, I will meet with policymakers at a higher level to get a feel for what is is developing from a natural resource management in these intensive lowland systems. So we're well positioned to fast project the the out, sorry fast track the outcomes of the project, and what we've said in terms of our ultimate um, goal is we're looking to see if we can improve the livelihoods of half a million farmers by 2022, and that's what we're sort of aiming towards phase one, the first four years. SDC, um, we're keen to build what we've done with IRRC and in a couple of the countries, they're looking to see if we can have outreach. But in the others, they also appreciated that we also need to do some basic research. Whereas in phase two, there'll be a much stronger focus on the outreach of the results from that research. 
So, okay, on to what, where, and when. And what we have here, so just trying to show a schematic. So we have the, the countries here, China, Indonesia in different colours going down. And across here, some of the activities we've been, been doing. So the needs assessment were undertaken in all countries in 2013. We have a new site now in Myanmar and that needs assessment was just being completed. And then from that needs assessment, it gave us a good understanding of what we should be thinking about in terms of rolling out. And also we undertook household surveys. And the household surveys have been done at different stages. We weren't going to do one in Vietnam initially because we have a data set from 2011, but it was in Anjiang and we're working primarily in Cantu and Long An, so we decided we'd, we would do one this year. This gives you an example, an overview of what's been done in terms of our household surveys. So we have got Ronald Dick and the Nun who left just recently and now Araline has taken over this data set. And this gives you a feel. This is our, our baseline data. But the baseline data, we also looked at villages that we'll be working closely with and villages which we're seeing as being our untreated or called Czech villages. So when we do our follow-up surveys, which will be in phase two of CORIGAP, we'll have before and after and with and without to look at what the impacts have been. Now, part of what we're doing, this all leads through to what we call adaptive research of best practices. So apart from some of the work that Sarah's been doing primarily with the ecological indicators, most of our work is done in farm, in the villages, in the countries, the six countries that are our partners. And so I'll go through what we mean by adaptive research as our model. What it is, is we do these needs assessments, rapid rule appraisals, and then from that we go on to do our more detailed quantitative household surveys. When I say detailed, some of these surveys take something like two hours to do. And then from this, we select our technologies based on the feedback. So in each country, some of our lead technologies that we're introducing that are new, they will differ from, from place to place. Then we'll do adaptive research where we are leading the trials. We, we will set up the trials. We'll make sure the technology, the, the new approaches are implemented correctly and follow set protocols. We establish field demonstration sites for the farmers to come and look at what is happening couple of times during the growing season. And at the end of the growing season, we re review the results with the farmers. And we do this, usually most of the sites have two crops a year. Some sites, like in um, Jogjakarta, they'll have five crops in two years. And we do that at the end of each of the cropping seasons. And from that interaction with the farmer groups, we then select technologies again, whether we want to just do a bit more, because often they say, oh, that was fantastic what you've done, what else do you have? Because we've got problems in this particular area with water management or wherever it may be. And then we'll, so we'll go through this iterative process. Then when we get to a stage where the farmers are, 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 are confident that these technologies are ones that they want to start adopting, they will then lead their own trials. And there we take a step back, so farmers are implementing it and we're there as advisors or our counterparts in country are there as advisors. And again, we review the results at the end of each cropping season. And when there's clear that these results are having quite a, an outcome, a positive outcome, then that gets through where we're informing policy and also the national extension system. So this is our adaptive research approach. It means each cropping season we could be doing something quite different from the previous cropping season quite different from doing sort of standardised work on a research um, Okay. And all this is done, as I mentioned before, in the context of natural resource management best practice. So what are the attainable yield gaps? And this is some very interesting data and it's actually quite surprising data when it starts coming through. This is the data from our household surveys. What we have here is this is this area, the, the green bars refer to the 
top 10% of the farmers. What are the yields of those top 10%? This here, the blue, refers to what is the mean of that particular farmer group. And in these cases, this is drawn from four villages in any, in any particular location. So you see that the, the gaps are quite large in wherever we work. And it ranges from about 20% up to about 40%. Okay, so given that background, what's been happening in terms of the progress? One, one particular study has been a study that's involved um, Alex Stewart, and he's worked, well, initially was working with Takahiro Sato, who left us earlier this year, and with our colleagues in Vietnam, particularly in Kent Tur. And there we're looking at three different management approaches. One is called Good Agricultural Practice, which is called Viet GAP or Global GAP. And these are farmer groups who are applying that, who have been accredited. Then we have others which are following another approach called small farmer, large field, and then farmers who are doing their conventional practice. And for each management approach, we had a treatment. One must do five reductions, which was managed by us. And then we looked at the usual practice. That would be farmer managed. So, so that could be looking at what the, the GAP approach at the moment is for those farmer groups versus where we're applying what we see is best practice. Five replicates, so five by three treatments by um, the control and treatment. So we've got 30 plots each of one hectare. And from that, this is just a, a snapshot. Now I'm giving you a snapshot. So the, the more detailed work will obviously, hopefully, get a um, presentation from Alex next year where we'll have all this data analysed. But what we can see here on this axis here, we have the profit. And these are the three groups, GAP, small farmer, large field, and conventional, conventional practice. And you see that there's quite a change, quite an increase in profit if we're looking at adopting the best practice of one must do five reductions. If you look at what's happening in China and their focus on yield gaps, and there it's looking at whether they adopt what they call three controls technology and they also have what is called partial adopters. This is data from, from um, one of our colleagues who we actually provided funds for at the end of, uh, of IRRC, um, Rufa Hu in, from, from Beijing. And they looked at um, farmers from a number of villages in Guangdong province and they have three different categories, non-adopters, partial adopters, and full adopters. And you see here that they are able to close the yield gap. So these are the mean yields here, and these are the yield gaps based upon the household surveys that Rufa Hu had done. So it's very positive if you're comparing those which are seen as full adopters versus those which are non-adopters, then you're looking at about a 17.5% closing of the yield gap. So from the, the best practices, we're also moving through to post-harvest. I don't really have time to really cover the post-harvest. I'll be touching on some of the work they're doing in terms of learning alliances. But there we're looking at the solar bubble dryer, flatbed dryer, um, super bags, and also we start to look at laser levelling and also straw management in Vietnam, the straw management particularly for use of, of growing mushrooms. And Bringing this data together and best practices, both with NRM and post-harvest, we then use a approach called the field calculator. And that's, that will be used across all countries, but at the moment we've just been working in, in, in primarily in Vietnam to validate the, the approach, and we go on to consider that. So the field calculator is an approach, it's like a decision support system trying to pull things together and provide recommendations on sustainable management practices. So here we're trying to see, if we're looking at what is happening in terms of profit and the agronomic approaches, but also trying to look at what's happening in relation to some of the ecological considerations. What we're looking at is trying to integrate the results coming out of the adaptive research from the agronomists who are leading that work through um, combining also information from the household surveys and 
in Vietnam, for example, there's um, particularly those farmers involved with GAP, good agricultural practice, they have quite extensive farmer diaries. So how are we tracking if we start looking at that? Well, in Vietnam, what we're looking at there was trying to do adaptive research, but looking at making sure we're collecting the requisite information so we can feed it into the field calculator. So this is work that Alex and, and Takehiro Sato did, and I've sort of described the, the study earlier on, where we're looking at the GAP, small farmer, large field, and the standard practice. And it's very important, again, that we're demonstrating these practices to farmers and we're getting feedback from each of the farmers at the end of each, each cropping season. And this is what the field calculator uh, can generate, a spider diagram, where we're looking at here, this um, one is sort of the standard if we're looking at what is happening in the conventional production areas. And if we then look at these red areas, means there's a reduction. So reduction in labour costs, reduction in fertiliser costs, so they're moving in. And this red band is where we've got the treatment, which is the one must do five reductions. So that's the best practice for it's being promoted in country in Vietnam, the Mekong Delta. And we've also had reductions in costs such as irrigation and reduction in pesticide use. So overall, you see, because of these reductions in input use, the profit has been quite impressive. Also what's impressive is the fact that these fertiliser, irrigation, pesticide use, those reductions are seen as being positive for the environment. How positive that is, is that's where we, we're going to sort of pass it across to Sarah and we'll go down to look at some of the factors that she's looking at in terms of those indicators. The yield was slightly higher, if not sort of similar in each of the, the places we were looking. So that's a very positive result. We've had a very positive result in terms of income for the farmers and it looks as though the indicators are that we're also having a positive response in terms of environmental sustainability. If you look at Thailand, there the result is even more stunning in terms of profit, although interestingly there we've had a bit of a reduction in yield. And so we need to understand what is happening there. It turns out one of the sites did have a particular problem with one of the pathogens, as I understand. And so we'll follow that through. So just one particular season, and we'll be following this through for at least um, two to three seasons. So underpinning all this different disciplinary work, we have these cross-cutting approaches. And the first is looking at environmental indicators. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And there's also a bit of research on biodiversity. The second cross-cutting one is looking at monitoring, evaluation and learning on gender related issues. And I'm not going to go into gender specifically here because we do integrate it within what we do in each of the activities. We also want to understand the key players and the factors in the value chain. And this is using a learning alliance approach that Martin Gummett has been promoting, and also Matty Demont and Peter Ritzer Art and their work on the socioeconomics looking at the value chains. And we are also, as I mentioned earlier, aligning with national policy initiatives, and we regularly engage with decision makers. So these are cross-cutting, and if we now look at the environmental indicators, in the group, returning to the GRISP vision, there's very, two very clear statements were reducing the environmental footprint, enhancing the ecosystem resilience of rice production. That gives us a warm inner glow when we read that. But what are we doing at IRI in relation to whether we, we are actually achieving this, particularly in these intensive lowland systems which are the rice bowl? and the rice bowls of today, but also the rice bowls of future generations. So we make sure that we've got sustainable actions happening in terms of the management of these systems. So in our proposal, we mentioned the, the phrase ecological footprint. And we're saying that we're going to target this food.